Okay, well, welcome back. Um, thanks, everybody. Well, once again, um, welcome to Confish 2022. I'd like to start by um, thanking our, our sponsors, Highmark Marine Fabrication and, and North Rim Bank. Um, as many of you know, we're doing these forums this year in a hybrid fashion. Um, so for those of you that are joining us virtually, welcome. And um, at the end of the presentation, we're gonna have a question and answer period. And um, so if you are online, um, just send the questions through the um, Q&A box and we'll gather those questions up along with those in the room. So next we're gonna hear a presentation about Bering Sea crab populations by Ben Daly with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Ben is the Alaska Department of Fish and Game's research coordinator for commercial ground fish and shellfish in the westward region, including Kodiak waters, the Aleutian Islands, and the Bering Sea. He supervises research and resulting management of commercial marine fisheries and serves as the regional crab fisheries scientific advisor. So thank you, Ben, and welcome and come on up. Thanks everyone, uh, happy to be here and thanks for uh, allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm Ben Daly, I work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game here in Kodiak. Uh, I'll be talking about Bering Sea crab populations uh, and talking about their current stock status. Um, so I'll have to nod to my pilot here to advance slides along the way, so bear, bear with me here. So go ahead. Space bar. There we go. Okay, so um, when thinking about the Bering Sea crab fisheries, um, I'm showing the retained catch here from going back to 1990s, so about the last three decades. Um, there's a handful of fisheries that have occurred over the over the years, but by far the top three that stand out in terms of the magnitude of those fisheries, absolute value, and their economic uh, importance: the Bering Sea snow crab, Bristol Bay red king crab and Bering Sea Tanner Crab. And um, you wanna hit the space bar again? There we go, I've got some animations here. So um, I refer to these, these fisheries as the, the big three, uh, just because they stand out from the others in terms of the magnitude of, their, of the catch. Um, that'll be the focal point for today's um, presentation. But I just want to acknowledge that there are other smaller scale fisheries that have occurred over the years. St. Matt's Blue King Crab, Pribilof Island Red King Crab, and Pribilof Island Blue King Crab have occurred sort of sporadic histories with long periods of closures but they are um, much lower in scale as sort of the big three. So a little bit um, in terms of kind of high elevation overview about how Bering Sea and Aleutian Island crab fisheries are managed. Um, it's, uh, they're part of a cooperative uh, management regime between the federal and state agencies. Um, sort of the federal, it's managed by the state with federal oversight. Um, uh, the federal government uh, develops regulatory regulations and management plans through the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service conducts surveys uh, to estimate population abundance, uh, as well as conduct fishery research. Uh, on the state side, through the Alaska Board of Fish process, um, the Board of Fish makes allocative decisions and establishes policy for management, whereas ADF&G implements fishery regulations and harvest strategies. And that's sort of where I enter the picture. I'm again, part of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and that's how I um, integrate into the kind of larger picture. Easy to summarize uh, the entire management structure in four small bullets, but there's a lot that goes into each one of these uh, pieces. So thinking about our understanding of uh, Bering Sea population trends over time, uh, there's a, a handful of kind of hypothetical scenarios. We could see a steady state or constant population abundance over time, cyclical, population trends, irregular population trends, and spasmodic uh, population trends. And there's example of these in all the, in, in the different Bering Sea uh, crab populations. And this presents a challenge in how we can account for this change over time. And so our understanding of grab, crab population abundance and its current status relative to what we've seen in the past, it really boils down to what we're seeing in the data. And there's very, various different data streams that are looked at to help us understand what's going on with the crab populations. We've got, of course, fishery data, 
in, 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 the, in the form of catch rates. Uh, it gives us information about size, composition of the catches, where the catches occur in space, as far as kind of the total magnitude of the fishery removals. Uh, fishery independent surveys are also a critical piece. They provide abundance indices, uh, also size compositions of the population, uh, spatial distributions, et cetera. And a key to um, the fishery independent surveys is kind of the standardization, which allows kind of comparisons in space and time. So that's a critical piece to these fishery independent surveys is kind of standardized grid patterns that are consistent over time. Um, oh, what, not quite. <laughs> Uh, and research is another big component of this. And research helps us understand the biology and ecology of the animals. For example, growth, reproduction, movement, um, physiological tolerances, et cetera. It's another, another kind of key piece in our understanding. Go ahead. One of the tools um, in our toolbox for understanding population trends are stock assessment models. These are quantitative predictions about crab populations. For Bering Sea crab, they use a length-based analysis. Uh, that's meant to reduce the uncertainty in the annual abundance indices. Um, they can account for things like gear selectivity from the survey, as well as natural mortality, growth, et cetera. But however, there's lots of assumptions that go into these stock assessment models that we need to kind of acknowledge and be aware of. So this slide has some animation, so it'll be kind of a multi-clicker here. Uh, but the stock assessment includes the stock assessment model. Uh, one of the, as I mentioned before, if we've got research data that feeds into the stock assessment model, again, we've got the uh, survey data in the form of an abundance index. Is it not working? Stand by a minute while we work through some technical uh, difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> things things aren't always cooperating around with the with the tech world. Yeah. It it, it also looks like it's uh, January outside there. We're having a lovely spring blizzard. Okay, it looks like looks like it's going okay here. Click, 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 click. Uh, click. Uh, okay, there we go. Let's just move on. Okay. Yeah, moving forward. All right, moving forward. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so in understanding kind of the management framework, there's a few management reference points that we'll talk to that are important to understand when we're talking about the stock status. This idea of BMSY, the biomass that enables the stock to deliver the maximum sustainable yield. This is the largest catches that can be taken over the long term without causing population collapse. Okay, that's one reference point to be aware of. Minimum stock size threshold is simply 50% of BMSY. When the stock be falls below 50% of BMSY, it's considered overfished. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into snow crab. Uh, mature male biomass, it's considered the currency of the stock. Um, and so when, we when we're talking about stock status, we're really talking about the current year's mature male biomass relative to our estimate of BMSY. So that brings me back to who am I again? I work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game as a research coordinator for shellfish and groundfish. Most of my time and energy is focused on Bering Sea crab fisheries. Um, I've got a biology and ecology background, not a modeling background. Um, I've been trained through uh, by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and have been studying crabs since 2004. What I do is try to con converge all these different data inputs into kind of uh, direct fishery outcomes and kind of all this stock assessment, survey data, fishery data kind of boils down to one number, and that's the total allowable catch. That's the limit of the catch for the directed fishery. And so that's a big part of what we do at the department is kind of synthesize all this different information into that one, um, what, one number. Go ahead. So probably the single most important piece of information that we use to manage these fisheries is the annual NOAA Eastern Bering Sea Bottom Trawl Survey. This happens each year, going back to 1975 in the summer. It's uh, made up of a, a, a gridded pattern, 375 stations in a standardized grid. Each one of those squares is 20 by 20 nautical miles. Um, it's a multi-species survey. It counts for um, various stocks of both groundfish and, and crab. Um, it uses an 83-112 Eastern Otter Trawl 
Um, it's the same gear that's been used going back to 1982. Um, on that trawl net uh, is, is um, a net mensuration gear, which is a, attached to the, the, the trawl gear. Uh, bottom contact sensor measures when that net makes contact with the bottom. Uh, there's net height and width sensors that can measure the, the width of the, of, of the, of the trawl net. Uh, the distance fished is um, estimated or calculated by GPS. And so we have uh, the length of the toe, the width of the toe. So you can imagine a, kind of a long, a, an elongated uh, rectangle of ocean bottom. That combined with the number of crabs coming up in the trawl net gives us an estimate of crab density at each one of these stations. Average all the stations to get an average crab density, and then you extrapolate that into the entire survey area. With all the recent changes in the environment in the Bering Sea, there's um, a strong interest to expand the survey area into the Northern Bering Sea. Uh, there's been a handful of surveys that have occurred in the Northern Bering Sea, I think five or six that have um, happened approximately every other year. Um, and with the, with the kind of renewed interest in these changing environment, uh, there'll likely be um, Northern Bering Sea Service surveys kind of continued into the future. So focusing on uh, kind of stock specific information, snow crab is really the kind of uh, the big one to talk about first. Um, this shows uh, the historical total allowable catches going back to 1982, pretty sporadic history where we had huge catches in the late 80s and into the 90s. And since then it's sort of been humming along at sort of relatively lower levels. Uh, the really the issue I want to talk about today is the magnitude of the drop that we saw in the 2021 fishery. Um, you can see the lowest tack that we've seen uh, on record, and we'll talk about why, why that is. So if I was to kind of try to summarize what's going on with Bering Sea snow crab uh, in one figure, for me, it would be this figure here. This is a size composition data for the survey for the last six years. Each one of those box, boxes corresponds to a single uh, uh, survey. Uh, the size of the crab is indicated along the x-axis, so larger crabs are more towards the right in each one of those boxes. Along the y-axis in each box is abundance, so we have abundances of crab at each uh, size class. And if you focus on uh, sort of the right-hand column, so the last three survey years starting in 2018, 2018 was probably the highest uh, abundance for snow crab we've had on record. So that was an exciting year. We felt the population was healthy. Uh, the future looked good. Then the 2019 survey came along. We weren't sure what to make of that big drop there. Uh, it could, we weren't sure if that was a true population decline, if there was a survey error. Um, the 2020 survey was canceled due to the COVID pandemic. And here we are in 2021 in that box in the lower right. Um, a pretty bleak situation for snow crab overall, uh, but you can see a pretty clear and distinct population decline from those three survey years. So that was kind of looking at that, that last figure was uh, for males of all size classes. If you kind of carve out different components of the population and look at where those are in 2021 relative to the entire time series for snow crab going back to 1980, you can see mature, mature females uh, among the lowest we've seen uh, in the history of the survey. Next. Uh, mature male biomass, again, the lowest, 2021 was the lowest we've seen on the survey or in, in the time series. Uh, four inch males, which is the size class that the fishery targets, uh, 2020, um, 2021, excuse me, again, was the lowest we've seen in the time series. So go ahead. Um, so again, the point being major decline uh, in the last three years. Uh, the stock assessment model estimated the stock to be 33% of BMSY. Because we're below 50% of BMSY, that puts us at a, an overfished classification. Um, per um, Magnuson Stevens Fishery Management Conservation Act, um, that requires that a rebuilding plan is put into place uh, within two years of the stock being declared overfished. So that's currently in development. Um, that's a kind of that process is driven by the council, um, where they recommend uh, rebuild, uh, recommend make recommendations for rebuilding the stock and consider things such as uh, harvest strategies, bycatch control measures, as well as habitat uh, protection. So the big question is, what the heck happened with snow crab? And um, it really boils down to kind of three core hypotheses. One that the survey was wrong, the population decline wasn't real, the crab are out there, the survey missed them. The second is that 
the population decline wasn't real. The crab are still out there. They just moved outside of the survey area. And the third is that they died. And so if we kind of follow Occam's razor, start with the most simple explanation, try to rule things out along the way to try to understand what, what happened. So I'll sort of walk through what we think is going on with snow crab. So the very simplest, they're still in the survey area. The survey missed them. Um, I mentioned the net mensuration gear that's attached to the bottom trawl nets. Um, that data has been combed through very carefully. There's no net performance problems that occurred that can confirm that the net was fishing normally. It, it made bottom contact. Um, if you look at the population abundance of tanner crab as kind of a similar species, we did not see the similar population decline for tanner crab. You could expect that if there was some problem with the net in the survey, you would see a similar decline with uh, tanner crab, a similar species, but we did not, we did not see that. So we're confident that there was no problem with the net performance. So could, they still could be in the survey and the survey survey area and the survey missed them. The, net, the as we all know, the Eastern Bering Sea is a, it's a vast, it's a vast ocean out there. The net touches a very small portion of that ocean. In fact, approximately 0.004% of the entire survey area is touched by the survey net. So you can imagine it's not unreasonable to think that the survey might have missed portions of the, of the population. However, because of the kind of uniform spacing, it seems unlikely that you would have huge aggregations of crab uh, kind of evenly spaced with, with, with uh, in between uh, the survey uh, trawl locations. Um, there's some areas near the shelf edge, kind of near the slope um, that are not covered by the survey, but those areas uh, are not large enough to account for the decline uh, in the numbers that we're seeing. Go to the next one. Now, if you look at the um, Bering Sea slope survey area, it's kind of indicated by this color band here. That's less than 10% of the uh, Eastern Bering Sea shelf area. Um, and when you're looking at the kind of the raw area swept numbers from the survey, um, we saw a, a population decline of nearly 2 billion animals, and that's just for the males. So is it really plausible that we saw this kind of like large scale spatial migration of all size classes um, from the Eastern Bering Sea shelf onto the slope? Um, seems unlikely. Um, go ahead. Is it possible that they moved north into the northern Bering Sea area outside of the eastern Bering Sea area? Well, I mentioned that that northern Bering Sea survey has been happening the two most recent years were in 2019 and 2021. And when we look at high density areas shown here of four inch males, um, the northern Bering Sea area um, doesn't explain the loss of crab uh, that we saw in the eastern Bering Sea. So what was going on during the fishery during all of this? Again, we saw this massive decline over a handful of years. Um, this figure is showing the fishery means centers of distribution uh, or centroids, kind of the average center of where the catch was coming from for each individual year. Sort of a cluster of dots with 2020 kind of standing out as the anomaly. Fishing occurred much farther north in 2020 than it has in the past. The figure on the upper right showing the latitudes of those centroids over time, and you can see the last handful of years, we started starting the sort of saw the fishing behavior was was moving north, with 2020 uh, being the by far the most northern fishing we've seen, and that's largely in the response to where the crab are. Fishermen are extremely good at finding crab, and so they're going where the higher catch rates are occurring. And if we look at that 2020 fishery a little closer, this map has. Um, blue dots that correspond to um, fishery average CPUE in space. So number of four inch males per crab paw on average, so larger blue circles correspond to um, better fishing. Um, we saw a slight uptick in the average CPUE in 2020 shown here. And that was largely because the fishery was moving farther up north. So there was some decent fishing way up north. In fact, it was so extreme that there was lots of concentrated fishing effort right along the Russian border um, in this kind of green, uh, green shape there. So is it, so that kind of begs the question, if fishing's getting very good, the farther we go up north, right up into the Russian border, is it possible that those, these crabs crossed into the Russian, into Russian waters? Uh, we, have, we don't really have a good handle on what's going on with population abundance numbers in Russian waters. But we've got some information about the fishery performance in, of the Russian fleet. Uh, this map uh, is, is showing uh, catch centroids from the Russian fleet for the last uh, 10 years. Um, I kind of, 
put a rough circle around that and marked where that location is roughly relative to where our fishery occurs. It's very pretty close to uh, the international border there. So when you look at the Russian fishery performance, which is shown in the lower left figure, you're sort of saying the steady increase in CPUE over time. So their fishing's getting better up until 2020, where we see this kind of drop. I, it's hard to see from the figure, so I added this blue, or excuse me, red um, um, arrow, but we did see a decline in the CPUE in the Russian fleet. So if crab on the US side are marching north, and are indeed crossing into Russian waters, you might expect to see an increase in the Russian CPUE, but we did not see that, we saw a drop. So it kind of begs the question, are crab moving from Russian waters down south into US waters? And that's why we were seeing kind of a better fishing up close to the Russian border. All this, all to say, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to crab movement relative to the international border. We don't have a good handle on abundance uh, crab abu snow crab abundance in Russian water. So it, all this creates another level of uncertainty and understanding what's going on with Bering Sea snow crab. So move Russian border issues aside for a second, that leaves kind of the final hypothesis, did they die? And that's sort of the current thinking that there was some high mortality event that occurred in the last handful of years. Uh, that caused the, po the extreme population decline that we've seen. The sources of the, that mortality uh, could be from a number of areas, uh, predation, disease, um, uh, changing ocean conditions, including uh, thermal stress, ocean acidification, dissolved oxygen levels, starvation, um, fishery mortality, or other. Um, there's some data to inform some of these things, in particular predation rates and disease. Um, but I won't get into that too much right now. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty with regard to the, the exact source of the, of the decline relative to mortality. So in summary, we saw a, dr a dramatic population decline in the last three years. The stocks declared overfished. Lots of uncertainty related to the cause of that decline. I mentioned movement issues, mortality issues, um, changes in fishing behavior, uh, Russian border issues that complicate our understanding of snow crab populations, as well as environmental change. There's like all that said, there's likely not one single smoking gun to explain the recent population decline. It's likely a combination of movement and a high mortality event. So changing gears to Bering Sea snow crab for a minute, um, or excuse me, Bering Sea tanner crab. Next slide. Um, Bering Sea tanner crab, it's considered one stock, but it's managed east and west of the 166 west longitude line. Go ahead. It's got kind of a variable history in the fishery. This is showing retained catch going back to 1990. We see a little bit of everything. Uh, pulses of high catch rates, kind of prolonged fishery closures, periods of kind of low fishery, low catch uh, levels uh, over multiple years of spikes in around 2014 and 15. And then the more recent years were sort of limping along with relatively low um, uh, fishery levels. So this figure is showing mature female uh, abundance, or excuse me, uh, biomass rather. And we can see kind of a cyclical nature of uh, mature male biomass trends where the, the one bright spot and mature in uh, uh, Eastern Bering Sea tanner crab as we're seeing a kind of a jump in, in abundance in 2021. Looking at mature males in the West, the raw area swept data from the survey indicated by the dots there are kind of among the lowest we've seen. However, the stock assessment model, which is indicated by the black line there is predicting um, a bit more optimistic situation with, with regard to the stock status. And that's in part due to the size composition, size composition information that I noted before. Um, you'll see in the kind of this big red box on the left hand side there, we're seeing juveniles in the population across multiple size classes. The problem is they haven't quite reached the five inch size class, which is indicated by that small red box there. So um, while the current uh, abundance of, of five inch males, which is the size class targeted by the fishery, um, those levels are quite low right now. We do have some hope for the future in that we're seeing some, some strong size classes in the, in the juvenile, juvenile sizes. Another bright spot I mentioned, um, uh, mature female uh, population trends. Um, that's shown in the, the black um, line here. I overlaid mature male abundance in here. And if you put the two over each other, 
you'll start to see a trend. And that is that the female population trend tends to lead that of males by one or two years. You wanna... And so here I marked, the, uh, I marked the peaks in abundance for mature females. And you can sort of think of females trends as sort of a predictor of what we might expect for males. Um, another click. And I marked the, um, the male uh, peaks here and you can see pretty clearly, at least in the last two uh, uh, abundance uh, spikes, there was this uh, one year lag. So we're starting to see an increase in females here in 2021. So there's hope that we might start to see increases in mature male biomass uh, in the next year or, or so. So overall, uh, mature females uh, sh uh, showed an increase in 2021 with respect to their abundance. This provides some hope for the future. Um, there's some signs of recruitment, particularly in the West. Uh, hopefully we see improved uh, numbers of five inch males uh, in the coming years. Um, however, they haven't materialized yet in those large size classes, hopefully yet. Hopefully they're coming still. So switching gears to Bristol Bay Red King crab here. So again, kind of a variable uh, history. Um, 2021, um, the fishery was closed for the first time since the mid 90s. We have been seeing a steady decline in the magnitude of the fishery over the last 10 years. And so we've been approaching this closure for a while now. Um, we finally got there this year. Um, if you wanna pause the, or go to the next slide. And that closure was driven uh, primarily by low mature female abundance. You can see this uh, population of mature females has been in decline for many years, um, sort of seeing the steady decline and with 2021 being the among the lowest we've seen um, in, in the survey. But again, the closure was actually triggered by a state harvest strategy um, relative to um, abundance levels of mature females. This harvest strategy has uh, been in place for a long time, since the, the mid 90s. It was established by um, the stock assessment author, Dr. Ji Zhang, who is a, a brilliant uh, fisheries uh, scientist. Um, the, the harvest strategy has been vetted by uh, mul multiple um, bodies throughout the years. And, 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 and there's a lot of confidence in the harvest strategy itself. The main goal of the harvest strategy is to protect females and maintain adequate males for fertilization in the population. This figure is showing uh, female abundance uh, over time. You can see 2021 uh, levels is just below that red line, which is the closure threshold, 8.4 million females is the, the trigger that causes the closure. The last time we saw uh, mature females in this low of abundance was during the, the closures in the mid 90s. Um, in terms of our confidence level in that actual abundance estimate for 2021, I kind of zoomed in on 2021. The dot there is the raw area swept estimate calculated from the survey. The line there is this, the estimate from the stock assessment model with a 95% confidence interval. And you can see that both the dot and the upper bound of that 95% confidence interval is below uh, that 4 point, or excuse me, 8.4 million uh, pound uh, threshold for closure. So we're, we're confident that in the, in the population number for mature females for 2021, A little bit more on that 8.4 million uh, animal uh, closure threshold. Um, it's admittedly a blunt tool. Um, it's meant to capture the bottom of the population in which the population is at such a low level that it can't sustain itself. Uh, we don't know what the true bottom is. It's meant to kind of approximate what we, it's an estimated level. Uh, it's an estimate of what the, the, the bottom of the population is. Uh, it's been around for a long time since the late 80s. It's um, established at 20% of the equilibrium level of fertilized females from a Ricker stock recruit curve, defined as the minimum mature female abundance that allows sufficient recruitment that the stock can actually reach a level that reproduces MSY. So this, this analysis has been around a long time, long before I was involved in any type of crab science. Um, looking at the size composition for males, um, you can see in recent years, the last three survey years on the uh, right-hand column, kind of low abundance numbers kind of across the board, particularly concerning though, is the low abundance numbers of the juvenile size classes. Kind of looking at various components of the population over time, mature males, um, again, kind of a steady decline over the last 10 years or so. Um, the dots in this case are the raw area swept numbers. The line is the model estimate of those uh, numbers. Um, you can see a slight increase in 2021 actually for mature males. 
It's unclear if that's the start of a true population increase or whether that's a, a matter of survey error. And that's kind of what the stock assessment models are really good at doing is trying to account for that. And so you can see the model estimate to flat from about 20, from 2019 to 2021. The model's not quite sure what to make of that slight increase in 2021. So hopefully the 2022 survey will come back um, with an increase in abundance and we can start um, feeling optimistic about a possible increase in abundance. Kind of same story with the legal size males, uh, sort of steady decline over the last handful of years, slight uptick in 2021 survey data, but it's un again, it's unclear if that's the start of a true increasing abundance trend or, or a, an artifact of, a, of the survey. As far as the outlook for Bristol Bay Red King Crab, it's estimated at 62% of BMSY, so we're not quite at the overfish status level, which again, remember, is 50% of BMSY. We're seeing a continued downward trajectory, particularly with females, slight increase in males in 2021. It's unclear if this is, again, as a sampling error with the males or the start of an increasing trend. Uh, hopefully, it's the latter. Uh, low estimated recruitment across the board. Um, females were below the harvest strategy this year, which triggered the closure. Um, length frequencies are a bit discouraging um, in that there's no strong pulses of small crabs in the system. Um, and we've got fluctuating environmental con uh, conditions um, and related impacts on Bristol Bay Red King crab are uncertain. So next slide. A little bit more of, on um, what we think is going on with the stock and why we've been seeing the steady decline for the last 10 to 15 years. Really, we think it boils down to low recruitment. And by recruitment, we just mean new individuals entering the population, or in this case, the stock assessment model. The model actually can estimate new animals entering the population. And that's what this figure here is showing is model estimated recruitment. Uh, it corresponds to crabs in the size class of 60 to 85 millimeters. So this is when kind of the model starts seeing crabs in the population. It can't really account for the really tiny crab, which are, you know, this, small is about the size of a pea when they first settle to the bottom. Um, and you can see the story is very low estimated recruitment, particularly in the last 10 years. And so what causes this low recruitment? Why are we seeing a situation where the crab isn't able to sustain itself in a healthy level? And it boils down to the females. Low female abundance can cause low recruitment, poor survival in the early life history stages, either because of predation, starvation, thermal stress or other uh, suboptimal environmental conditions, as well as unfavorable lar larval advection. When the larvae are reaching the post-larval stage, they're starting to settle out on the ocean bottom and they require a very specific type of habitat to settle onto and survive. And so if these larvae are being advected away from this optimal settlement habitat, um, that could be another reason for poor survival and low recruitment. So what can we do? And all of this for Bristol Bay Red King Crab, protect the females, minimize fishery mortality and by, by, through bycatch reduction uh, and habitat and closure areas, as well as habitat uh, protection. Uh, we can optimize mating opportunities um, so that we can maintain adequate males for fertilization, um, as well as understand critical spawning habitats so that we can um, make sure that those locations are being protected. Okay, last slide. Um, so in summary, talking about the big three, um, with snow crab, the story is the dramatic decline we saw in this last three years. The population is declared overfished. Um, the cause of that decline is unknown, but likely related to both movement and a high uh, level of natural mortality. Um, it's unknown if those mechanisms stopped or if they're ongoing. Um, for tanner crab, uh, we're seeing low abundance of legal males, but signs of incoming recruits. Um, juvenile cohorts uh, have not quite reached those uh, legal size classes, but there is a glimmer of hope for the future for tanner crab. For Bristol Bay Red King crab, we're seeing the continued population declines, particularly with the females and low overall recruitment. So with that, uh, sorry to end on that bleak note, but uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, it looks like we have about 10 minutes for questions. So. Uh... We'll start with um, anybody in the room have a question and we can move to um, some questions online as well. Thanks. That way people on listening online can hear too. Thank you, Donnie. So it would be interesting to know if you have a if you have a, an overlay or comparison 
visual where you see that the, the recent catches, the snow crab, and with all the trawl surveys and, and over about, you know, like they pick, go back X number, not very far, and, and see, if, and, and, you know, they can correlate, be able to correlate that. Um, can you repeat the question? Correlate what now? Well, I mean, it'd be interesting to be able to see the, uh, the, the a, a chart of the trawl survey stations and the catch rates over the last three or four years. Uh, in the catch rates in the fishery, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah the catch CPUE for as the, as, the, yeah. as the, the fleet moves, the catch moves, the ice moves. Right. And then sort moves, of and moves uphill. A, yeah, yeah. Sort of make a correlation between the fishery catch rates and the survey kind of abundance levels in space, I think is kind of looking at how they overlap. And a visual, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, uh, yeah, we, we, could, we could do, we could overlay um, various layers of, of information to show. I think the basic thing is that there's a general good, good, good correlation with where the fisheries occurring and where the survey um, is catching high abundance levels. You know, it's generally, you know, you see good catch rates in areas of the survey that had, were showing high abundances of crabs, it's a fairly strong correlation there. But but I but um, you know that information you know we do have that information. We're capable of you know making that visual you know overlapping those layers in a, in, in a map or or, or putting uh, centroids of the fishery and the survey together on the same map. It's just such a vast area. Yeah. Even overlaying state or something. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to zoom way out to get the whole area for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Do mm -hmm. any more questions? Oliver? Uh, do you see any correlation between recruitment events and uh, for the different species and the bottom temperatures in the Bering Sea? You know, the thing with crab is that they don't really have a stock recruit relationship. And so what that means is you can have examples of good recruitment when there's low female abundance or low bio, you know, population biomass and vice versa. And so that's telling us that the, the survival rates are highly uh, variable and dependent on environmental conditions. Um, I haven't looked, per, getting back to your original question, I have not looked uh, exactly at um, correlating recruitment levels to bottom temperatures per se, but that's uh, that's that's a good good thought of something that would be easy enough to do. Anybody So you were talking about snow crab and you were talking about movement and mortality, but you didn't amplify what are the thesis or what are the uh, suspected causes of mortality. And I know those aren't provable, sure. but as a, a scientist managing this fishery, what do you think's happened? Yeah, great question. You know, I kind of alluded to some of the different pieces in one of those slides there. Um, we do have some data from the survey. I mentioned the survey. Um, is one of our, our, our uh, most reliable and impactful data streams. One of the things they do do on the survey is collect uh, stomachs from fish, ground fish. And so we've got stomach content data and those data do suggest that predation by cod in particular has increased in recent years. So that's kind of a signal about what's going on. The thing with that is, you know, ground fish predation on snow crab is primarily on crab that are 60, centimeter, 60 millimeters and smaller. So that can explain that might explain what's going on with the decline with the smaller crab. They don't so much prey on the larger crab. There's some caveats to that. You know, the survey is collecting data in the summertime um, when crab snow adult snow crab are likely not molting, and so there could be a, more predation on these larger crabs at other times during the year. Uh, we're not seeing that in the data stream just because the data is being collected in the summer. So so anyway, predation is one one potential source. Um, we've got some information on disease prevalence, particularly bitter crab syndrome for snow crab. And some there's some uh, information to suggest that bitter crab syndromes uh, becoming more prevalent in recent years. So those are two that um, we do have some information on. Um, physiological tolerances to a changing environment or another. We've got ocean acidification issues. Um, this is a cold adapted species. So warming conditions are going to be stressful for these animals. 
whether, you know, how much these different factors play into the overall survival is sort of difficult to tease apart, but those are kind of a handful of the suspected causes. Sure. Uh, I realize it's a little bit uh, different apples and oranges, but how would you uh, describe the bad health, for lack of a better, in the Bering Sea crab fisheries across the board with the biology in the Aleutian Island crab fishery, which appear to be strong? Yeah, Aleutian Island being golden king crab you're referencing. Yeah, uh, boy. Good question. I don't have a I don't have a snappy answer on that one. You know, um, gold. It's a different you know different species, different different uh, e ecological requirements there. Um, perhaps um, you know that's a those those crab are in much deeper water. It might be a more stable environment there in terms of you know temperature and ocean acidification. It's sort of hard to say. Thank you very much for your time today, Ben. Really Great. Thanks. It. Questions and answers yeah, at this point. I would so, agree. Uh, but, yeah, thanks. Stretch your legs, and then we're going to hear from uh, Matt Nichols about Gulf of Alaska Canna crab populations. <laughs> 